And welcome back to the second hour of the Velocity of Now with me, your host, Mr. Herb. And uh, no, I'm not accidentally starting the, the theme tune again. I'm just trying to create a little bit of atmosphere for this next uh, hour. And in this second hour, we will be dealing with the great John D, a man I have had tremendous respect for for many years since I first read about him in Lewis Spencer's Encyclopedia of the Cult from the 1920s, which I still have my original copy, and it's a beautiful book and something that has given me so much education for my Fortean and magical insights in life. And we'll be using, along with the superb biography by Benjamin Woolley, which is uh, that's W-O-O-L-L-E-Y, that came out in 2001, and it's one of the better mainstream bookstore biographies. It's highly readable. It's uh, very well done. It's full of all the research you need, and it's not not full of any real nonsense. And so that's the, the main source for tonight's. You know, we're not going to be using web pages or, you know, YouTube videos made by some Christian lunatic or some someone who was raised in a theosophist cult compound, worships Madame Blavatsky as a god, and then thinks he's actually the only one who knows about this stuff because he, he never had a real job. That's because he was created to be your New Age guru from his New Age family. So this is tonight, is dispelling the myths, this is the truth-free or the theosophy, not, well, not anything else, the theosophist, but, uh, you know, cult-free, cult, uh, shall we say, programmed cult compound a uh, product that you all get your got your information on these kinds of people from this is a, a scholarly insight from a normal guy who knows stuff and is not doing it to try and scare you or anything as i said i have a phenomenal uh, a phenomenal respect for dr john d i really do i mean the guy there was i mean he was the ultimate renaissance man forget about michelangelo Caravaggio, Leonardo da Vinci, Brunelleschi, he was another great, they were all great, specifically Brunelleschi, but, and Albeck, of course, Albeck Dure, but he was it. He, he was, he is the man the world that you live in today was built upon. And he created the modern world that you live in up until probably the arrival of Crowley, as a magical spell. Now Crowley's magical spell, the, the Eon of Horus, it, it has it has been remarkably successful, but it's not going to last as long as what he envisions envisioned. And that's because Crowley, as genius as Alistair Crowley was, he was no John D. He was absolutely no John D. John D is, in my opinion, one of the greatest minds that's ever walked the face of this earth. And in many ways, he created, he really was the kind of Lucifer's emissary. Now, I mean, in a positive sense, I mean, in the sense that, you know, I actually admire Lucifer, what the Luciferian idea is. I admire the idea of the, the, the purity of truth. This is a man who risked opening the gates of hell in order to find the truth. Lucifer was cast out of heaven because he spoke the truth. John Dee was cast out of his homeland and his entire life and made remarkable risks in his existence in order to find the truth. So all you truthers who are all Christians are going, John Dee, satanic, uh, satanic, uh. you're wrong. You're wrong. This is one of the ones who is on our side. This is one that this is what you need. Doesn't matter if they go down the wrong path or they go down ways that are offensive to you. That's not what, what John D. What John the journey that John D. embarked embarked upon five hundred years ago. That that journey you're irrelevant to that. Okay, what well, your opinion does not matter. My opinion doesn't matter, but I'm just telling you that this guy was absolutely sensational. And not just for his magical insights, but for many other things. Now, there's lots of there's lots of silliness out there about him, and there's lots of I wouldn't say disinformation, but like uh, factual 
you know, Ian Fleming based, you know, it, it came with the idea of 007 for James Bond from while he was writing Casino Royale, the first uh, Bond book. He, came, he was reading a biography of D and he came across 007. Now, people say that in the, in the, in the, in the truth scene, they say that D's original name was 007. It wasn't. This is where he's get back to the facts. D had been pulled before basically the, the Queen's Privy Council and demanded to know why he addressed, the, why he wrote this, this symbol, which is two circles and a kind of a long seven on top of it. And it was basically a symbol for Queen Elizabeth. So 007 was really Queen Elizabeth, according to D. Well, according to what D told the, these guys. And he said that the two circles were the eyes of the Queen and the number seven, which was a lucky number, which it is, was written above her eye and down the side. So it was a kind of a, it was a kind of a talisman. But so what, D wasn't 007. Queen Elizabeth was 007. And the 007 represented what, according to D now, her two eyes and the lucky number seven to give her a fortuitous reign. So with that, we have broken open a first kind of, shall we say, meme or trope of the alt scene. And let's continue with this. Now, D was born in 1527, and he died in 1608. So he had a good long life for those days, and especially considering, you know, shall we say, the circles he moved within. And we all know he was, well, maybe you don't all know, but he was a remarkable mathematician at a time when mathematics was considered to be a form of sorcery, an astronomer. And then he had a, a great interest in hermeticism, which is the magic of ancient Egypt. And he was also a wonderful astronomer. He initially taught, he taught, he studied at the universities of Louvain and Brussels, and he taught Eleusian geometry at the University of pa Paris before he came back to England in 1551. He, he began his collection of books and manuscripts into the occult while he was over in Europe, in mainland Europe. He really didn't take off as his father was a, basically a customs uh, and excise official in London docks. And, you know, so he, he came from a kind of a minor, well, well, a well-to-do family that had money coming in, but he wasn't an aristocrat or anything like that. His father basically got a cut of all the, the he checked and rechecked and all the customs and excise, the incoming outgoing products out of the port of London. And his payment was a cut of this. Now, at the time, England was an extremely poor country. It was one of the poorest countries in Europe. And so this probably would have made him one of the richest men in London at the time. This, this is Dee's father now, simply because of the he was able to skim off a, a tariff from all the, the imports and exports. So like 15 years after he came back to England in 1551, he, when Queen Mary, who was a Catholic, succeeded her half-sister, Elizabeth IV, who was the daughter of Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, and reportedly asked Dee to predict the date for her coronation. Now, Dee successful, you know, Dee's involvement with India cult got really, really stronger when he met this character called Edward Kelly. Now, Edward Kelly is a far more interesting character than many people even know. See, there's a lot of focus on Dee, but if Dee didn't exist at that time, perhaps Edward Kelly would be the premier occultist of the Renaissance. Now, Kelly is an interesting character, as I wrote a section on him from the Druid Code, which I'll read now. Now, I can hear you asking yourself, what has Kelly and Dee got to do with Druids and Druidy? And my own book, the, the Druid Code, Magic, Megaliths and Mythology, well... Let, let me read this section for you and let this sink in. Incidentally, the flamboyant Elizabethan occultist Edward Kelly, who collaborated with John Dee to bring forth the Enochian language from the spirit world, came from the powerful Umain dynasty, who was also to be the rector, who also claimed to be the rector descendants of the Tuatha Dé Danann. A part of the kingdom included the Ratcrogan Crucon area of County Roscommon. How Kelly acquired his frankly astounding magical abilities. And from this, come came to enjoy the patronage of the most powerful people in Europe during the Renaissance. 
remains a total mystery. Was Edward Kelly a living repository of some druidical tradition within his own family bloodline, and because of this was employed to open up portals into other planes of existence, into parallel worlds? His spectacular successes, along with his understanding of magic, went far beyond anyone else in Europe at the time. The likes of McGregor's Mathers and Edward Kelly were essentially a continuing of the magical tradition going right back to the shamanic traditions of the megalith builders. Portals and doorways, questions and answers. So Kelly was part of a continuum which I've tried to outline in my own book, The Druid Code. This may have been what brought him and Dee together. Remember, Dee's own background was Welsh. So they're both of the, quote-unquote, small C, Celtic, magical tradition but they came from two different paths we're not really you know kelly came from his own sort of occultic past of necromancy and so on as well as uh, alchemy and conjuring and divination scrying while d came from a, a purely scientific thing but along the way very early on while he was in cambridge especially he was doing He was doing very successful horoscopes for people who were actually, the horoscope came true. They would, you know, people would be killed in battles. He would tell them they were going to be killed in a battle and they were killed in a battle. So that's why Kelly would have been so, you know, Kelly, Kelly would have been a major figure had not Dr. John D. come along. Now, as I said, D's involvement with the occultism deepened, and when I say deepened, it was literally a, a full-in dive. This is a man who wanted to understand the absolute mechanics of the universe. Mathematics was one part. And remember, at the time, mathematics was considered a, you know, it was considered a form of witchcraft at the time. That was one path. Astrology, astronomy was another. The occult was simply another part of the, the overall craft to build his own personal model of the universe. Now, Kelly was much younger and he had he was a medium and the <clears throat> these gifts or these abilities D quickly lacked onto because D himself didn't have them. D was not, you know, he was not a squire, he did not have, shall we say, paranormal abilities. He just he believed in them. Other than he was very good at divination. That's why divination, things like tarot cards and astrology, it's not really magic, it's a different thing altogether. Kelly had the magic. They used to have these, what they called spiritual conferences. And they were incredible, very deep and remarkable events. And during one of them, he persuaded Kelly, this is, persuaded D that angelic beings had singled him out for a higher purpose. Well, it's come to true pass, hasn't it? Before he discovered what the purpose was, Kelly had switched his attention to alchemy. This is Kelly has, was, was similarly obsessed and uh, driven. He dived straight into alchemy. And he claimed to have this. Now, this is bizarre. He had this red powder. Where this red powder came from, I don't know. But there's similar stories in Druidic tales of, of powders that were kind of had magical abilities. Remember, Kelly came from the Umain dynasty, which claimed to be directly from the Tuwede Danon, who brought four treasures to Ireland. And of course, this red powder had the alchemical ability to turn base metal into gold. One of the characters who comes in here now, who's very interesting, and you don't hear a lot about him, was this Polish aristocrat by the name of Prince Lasky who also had the same interest as both Kelly and D. And it was in the summer of 18, sorry, 1583 that he and Kelly, with their wives, travelled to Poland and then on to Prague with Kelly to manufacture gold. And would, I'm missing a lot of details here. We'll get back on in a second. I'm just going over to, this is a general biography. They went over to Poland in order to manufacture gold and to, quote unquote, talk to these angelic beings. After a lot of diplomatic, shall we say, cloak and dagger to and fro things, they eventually found the ear of King Rudolf II of the Holy Roman Empire, also King of Bohemia, the most powerful Catholic leader in Europe at the time of at the time of the Reformation. 
and he was also well, he was a strange character, remarkable character in many ways, and he was a he was a fan of of you know of alchemy. Now this at a time when Bohemia, not necessarily Prague, but Bohemia itself was becoming the center, the sort of like the solar plexus of Europe, of the goddess Europa, and that's how they saw themselves. This tremendous power that the root of himself was a was that Habsburg of the huge like dynasty that stretched from Spain across into in the Austro Germanic part of the world. He was part of this and he he his interest in alchemy it wasn't just alchemy. I mean this is a this is a time when he brought remarkable individuals and Prague itself was a remarkable spot. I mean you had Rabbi Lowe who actually created the golem at this time. Now remember the the synagogue in Prague, the old new synagogue, was discovered by Orthodox Jews back in 900. We're talking about the time of the the Vikings, and they said they claimed that it was an ancient, it was a cairn or it was a megalith. And megaliths always come back to it, folks, on the hill in the center of Prague, which later became the Jewish quarter where the old new synagogue was built. The reason why they called it the old new synagogue is because the chief rabbis had determined that the original synagogue that was there was the old synagogue and had been built at the time of the second temple. So therefore, the most powerful or the oldest synagogue on earth next to Jerusalem was in the middle of Prague. And that's how it became the old new synagogue. So Prague itself was the center of this, this esoteric Kabbalism, you name it, it was all there. If there was one place that John D. and Kelly should have been at this time, it was in Bohemia. Now, what happened was, after basically promising Rudolf II that they would produce, well, not promising, but suggesting that they had the ability to create base metal into gold, it failed, and they ended up behind bars. They were, there was probably just a warning, and it was probably that we, we don't know. They may have been suddenly arrested because they were probably seen as Protestant spies. So we have to, there's other things going on here. We're, we're basically going by conflicting sources from the era. Basically, the Bohemians thought that a suspected Dee and Kelly were spying on behalf of Queen Elizabeth, and Kelly and Dee thought they were locked up because they weren't producing the goods. It was probably a mixture of both. So they were told to keep on trying, and uh, again, it didn't work, and they went back to jail. Now, what happened next is really bizarre. Dee's son, whose real father was probably Kelly, after a sexual magic union, a coupling that took place back in England where they had to swap wives sexually, maintained that Kelly sought to escape but was constantly recaptured. But we, this is all, again, conflicting things. D was a lot more fortunate. He returned. He actually got back to England alive, and he was still in favour of the Queen because he basically saved her life. Queen Elizabeth. This is Queen Elizabeth now, and he became a warden of the Theological College in Manchester. He spent his final years at home in Mortlake, which is an interesting place because it means basically means dead pool, dead pool, and it's along the side of the River Thames where the majority of his uh, his enormous collection of occult books which sadly have all, many of them have been lost and manuscripts were contained uh, he was almost 80 years old and he died broke, financially ruined and in poor health a brewery was built on the site and uh, it's been developed since, I think the brewery is still there but it's, it's it, I don't know what the story is at the moment if it's being redeveloped now D is book, the Liber Logareth, which is the book of the speech of God, is in the British Museum. I've never seen it. I missed out on the D exhibition that was recently held in London, much to my disappointment, as is, is, is Obsidian Scrying Mirror and, or, you know, Speculum, which is basically a mirror just for scrying, which carry, in which Kelly saw the spirits. So Kelly also used, I believe, a crystal, a white quartz crystal, which Austin Osmond Spare also used. And these Enochian texts came out in reverse cipher, a fully formed language with the grammar, syntax, spelling, everything in reverse because it was too dangerous to put it 
to bring it out as a Nokian speech directly. The, the likes of McGregor's Mathers of the Golden Dawn and Alistair Crowley are, were themselves protégés of D much later on. And Crowley's own experiments, in which he conducted with another uh, magician called Victor Neuberg, when in the desert in Algeria, when they walked from basically they walked from Egypt to Algeria, uh, it, that's also in the book The Vision and the Voice. That's Libra four eighteen by Crowley. The some philo- some some many say that the angelic language is more to English spoken by God. That it, when creating the world, than you know, than the chatting of Adam. Now, this is a, a, the, the, the Enochian thing. If you look at the language, I find the actual the look of it very modern. It almost looks like seventies script. The Enochian language, when it was brought through by Kelly, I mean, it, either Kelly was the greatest genius, linguistic genius that ever lived to have developed and pulled forward a language in reverse cipher for the say and then to get it all right when it was written down correctly in you know incorrectly in its in its in its literal form. He was either great one of the greatest minds that ever lived or he wasn't. Now now when when Kelly went back to England, sorry when when D went back to England, Kelly remained in Bohemia. And by all accounts and by all accounts he managed to have some spectacular success with the red powder creating the gold. It worked for a while. He was arrested again and he died trying to escape from prison. When D found out, all he wrote in his private diaries was, D is slain. Now, a lot of you what listen to this show will have been aware of most of this. And so I want to, that's just basically the general introduction. Now I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a more sort of a, a deeper insight into, into Dee's life that shows just how brilliant he was. When he was at Cambridge, for example, they would hold plays and he would create all kinds of mechanic, mechanical devices and lifters, lifting objects and all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, cam wheels pulley systems to create incredible special effects that took place during these plays the, you know and this is at a time too when you had henry the eighth you know the dissolving the catholic church in britain and ireland tearing down the monasteries and winning a lot of favor with the people because in places like london Henry VIII was able to turn over large amounts of land that had been previously, previously been owned by the monastic orders for development. So it was a great time of, you know, London's population went from 50,000 to 200,000. And it was also a time of insecurity. Now, if anyone, now, as I said before, especially when Elizabeth came to the throne and there was you know, endless attempts to try and assassinate her. This was a, she was a, an unrepentant Protestant at a time when most of Europe was under the control of the Jesuits. This is where the whole idea of the Jesuits in the shadow where a knife comes from. Cloak and dagger. For her, for that point, for anyone to say that this was the start of the greatest empire in history would have been laughable. England was a very poor country at the time. It didn't ha- even have the means to really defend itself against anyone. It had no navy as such. A few broken ships, half of them were only good for scrapping. And an economy that was basically in ruins, though it was developing due to the... the one of the reasons that the economy in England was so poor was because of Catholicism. So much monastic land had been taken from the landlords and for urban development that basically it stifled the economy. That's it played a huge part in it. Also, wars in Ireland had run them down. It, England had, def, had 
been subject to massive defeats in Ireland, particularly the Battle of the Yellow Ford, which was the, the largest defeat by an English force ever in Ireland. And they just couldn't control it. England, Elizabeth favoured diplomacy in Ireland rather than war, which is probably a good idea, trying to buy Irish earls and give them titles and so on, to, you know, with, with quite a lot of success, I might add. And it was, if you were to say, Dan, that this, this, this failing kingdom torn apart by sectarianism between Catholics and Protestants couldn't even control any part of Ireland, really, outside of Dublin, and had basically capitulated to the to the whims of the Irish aristocracy, if you were to say that these guys were to become the greatest empire in the world from that point on, it would have been it, it would have it would have been laughable. It would have been laughable. If we like saying today that Bosnia now well that's probably not that's probably too extreme. Let me think. If we like saying today that Mexico was going to become the next superpower. That's what it was the equivalent of. Mexico will be the next superpower. And and that's exactly what happened with England and the creation of the British Empire. Now, the, the British Empire was devised by Kelly in four volumes. And he didn't call it the British Empire. He called it the British Imp empire like imperial imp we all know what an imp is this is very interesting stuff d was also as you know a navigator a cartographer and very interested in marine and shipping he was also obsessed by the weather he took tremendous readings of the tidal changes in the Thames near where he lived at Mortlake, also of the sky, precipitation, and so on. At the time, he was heavily involved in the occult. He was basically learning about weather magic. He suggested that to Elizabeth that they build a series of stout ships, small, heavy ships, basically creating the start of this British empire with the parts of Ireland under it within the, the sort of say, the Tudor sphere of influence, which would have been the pale around Dublin, as well as England, not so much Scotland at that time, Wales, and to create of English oak and to go after the, the Armada. This would be like the defensemen, say, say like a, a, now the Armada had 200 ships that were absolutely gigantic. Now, this would be like, the, as I said, Mexico today, say an advisor, an astrologer coming up to the president of Mexico and saying, you've got to build these jet fighters, special type, and we're going to take on the Americans and destroy them. That's literally what it was like. Spain under Philip was the undisputed superpower. The Pope had created an edict where he had given South America to the Portuguese and North America to the Spanish. There was a meridian line at the Azores. Dee looked out and said to the Queen Elizabeth, we need to take the entire Atlantic. Just control the Atlantic. At a time when they didn't even have ships. Because we are dealing with Elizabeth and what she was known as the Fairy Queen. And as Alan Moore said, she wasn't known as the Fairy Queen for nothing. She surrounded herself with occultics, cultists, mystics, mystics, astrologers, and so on. This was also a belief that England, England's return to power, this British empire, would be the new Atlantis which had risen again. Now, I'm going to read here from a passage in Benjamin Woolley's book, The Undiscovered Limit, and a section called The Undiscovered Limit, undiscovered limit to stress this point in late 1560s 
sorry, in late 1560s, Humphrey Gilbert had started work on a treatise to examine whether the Northwest Passage existed. His argument was, in the manner of the time, based not just on the still sparse current geographical formations, but on ancient authorities. The most important authority on geography was Ptolemy, whose map divided the world into three continents, all joined together by land, Europe, Asia and Africa. But Plato challenged this view, writing of another landmass, a huge island larger than Asia Minor and Libya combined. According to an Egyptian priest, it was situated beyond the Pillars of Hercules, the, the ancient name for the Straits of Gibraltar, which was then seen as the gateway into the unknown. The island was called Atlantis. According to the Egyptians, Atlantis had been swallowed by the ocean that shared its name, the Atlantic. After a series of earthquakes, Gilbert, however, was convinced that it had survived and was the continent that the Spanish now called America. This would explain such discoveries as the coins of Augustus Caesar, which had been found in the mines of South America and Red Indians washed up on the Baltic coast. Importantly, this also meant that this new world had already been discovered in antiquity, so their descendants had equal, if not better, claims for it. If it was an island, then obviously it was surrounded by water, which meant there must be a way around its northern shore. The fabled Northwest Passage, via this route, navigators would soon come upon Café, the home of Kubla Khan, the famous fabulous wealth of Khan's court, described by the great 13th century Venetian traveller Marco Polo, was legendary throughout Europe and later inspired Coolidge's famous lines in Xanadu that Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree. By the 15th century, upheavals in the Mongolian and Ottoman empires had made the old land route of Cathay increasingly difficult, so explorers had tried to find another way. This is why Columbus set sail in 1492. He was hoping to reach Cathay by circumnavigating the globe. Gilbert's central idea that Columbus's new world was Atlantis was supported or perhaps even inspired by John Dee, whose name was used in the treatise dictatory epistle to endorse the scheme. A great learned man, Mr. D, dot seemed to be well liked of this discovery and dot much commanded the author. Around this time, D was also studying an account written by Columbus's son of his father's travels and his annotations show that D clearly thought that the work might yield some of the secrets of Columbus's extraordinary successes. He marked the passages dealing with the adventurer's methods for keeping records, dealing with natives and exploring the discoveries of precious ores. Naturally, then when the news emerged of Frobosier's plan to test Gilbert and find the Northwest Passes, D was an obvious source for the navigational knowledge the adventurer would need. Now, why this is so important is, now, now why the Atlantis thing is brought into this is a magical idea. It's one thing to say this continent the Spanish have discovered called America to its northern area, north of Canada, you can sail around it. We know that's possible today. There's all those islands up there, but they're all per, you know, permanently submerged basically in, in ice. There was a belief that there was a, a way around there by sea, which could circumnavigate America and go directly to China. Because, again, the Muslims had cut off trade into Europe from the East. The implication of this being Atlantis was not so much a factual expression, shall we say, but more akin to a magical quest. You know what I'm saying? Like, for instance, if I want, you know, this idea of magic inspiring people to go further, Suppose you were leading a, a, a platoon of troops across a, a mountainous region to try and get them to a certain spot to liberate them. You could sit there and say things like, we must capture this land because it will further the military objectives of our current strategy. 
it sounds very cold, right? To put that into magical language, you would say, in the distance is that mountain. That mountain is a sacred mountain. And by us as warriors capturing this mountain, we are embarking on a sacred quest to secure not only a mountain of the holy God himself, but also of our own personal destiny in doing so. You see the difference? That's the magic. That's the magic. When you sex it up that way, using this kind of like fruity language, and to to use a modern term, that's how you do it. This has been well known. This is magic. So it's very easy for us to laugh at these, these kind of things these days, but this is how you do it. So you're more likely to get people to fork out money, ships, and especially the fairy queen, Queen Elizabeth, if you, if you discuss it in the, the form of a magical quest, i.e. the discovery of Atlantis. This is D using the occult for basically a navigation and exploration project. And it works. As you've heard me embark on other, shall we say, um, talks on magic, on the velocity of now, you've heard me say that once you enter into a magical state, by that I mean seeing the world and seeing your own life in these magical terms, magic unfolds in all other aspects of life. It's, 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 like, it's, it's like synchronicity plus kind of thing. Now, I told you that D went to Prague to meet with Rudolf II and continue the alchemical and, and spirit, angelic messages from beyond with Kelly. At the same time this is going on, Rabbi Lowe's was creating a golem. Now, a golem is, as you know, we should know a golem is a, a a creation made from mud or clay, and then a, a, a kind of a an an auto, autonomous complex infused into it, where it brings it to life, but it doesn't actually give it a soul. A beast without a soul means that it's alive, it's a person, it's but it doesn't have a resolved soul. So it was kind of like that amazingly okay the word robot which is also a beast without a soul the word robot is the check word for worker again the magical insights unfold as you look a theatricality is as much a part of magic as anything else this is glamour this is showbiz this is the spectacle Magic, even when you announce magic words, you do them when you make a pronouncement of magic words. You, you, you speak them from the stomach, like an operatic soprano delivering. It's the same kind of idea. Arne van o gadret, adne ox fal natgemish, Orza Valge Mea O Gaveda on Zemba Nordhad Von Fad Alden. That's how you speak in Nokian. Now, this is actually what I just actually did there was a, a dictation from the Book of Secrets which, uh, again, was dictated to Kelly by a sexual being. a an, Well, he called it algelic. It could have been demon. A sexual being called Medini, who was this flirtatious, beautiful woman who dictated the Enochian to him. And this, hap- this, this led to a thing called a book, Lines in the Books of Secrets. On the 9th of April, this was back in 1583, a visitor arrived at... Mortlake, which is uh, Dee's house, claiming to be a Macedonian from Macedonia. And he was carrying letters written by someone called Sanford, who may have been this character called James Sanford, who was a writer and astrologer who had translated Agrippa's book on magic 
and had been promoting the idea of an Elizabeth having a key role in the coming new world. Foretold by the coming of the fiery Trigon. Trigon appears to be the burning out of one reality and the start of another, as in a Trigon is also used in secret societies, which would have been the whole world at that time. There would have been very little else other than secret societies operating between the courts of Europe. From this point on in the broadcast, because of that invocation I did in the Nokian, just see if you hear any kind of strange anomalies in the show. Don't be frightened or anything. It's just like this is a this is a thing that seems to happen to me all the time. I seem to be able to invoke these strange voices in the background that appear when I'm when I do this kind of thing. It may not happen. It may may happen, but I'll try to keep spaces more now when I talk to see if anything shows up, like my infamous Jimmy Savile six 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 serial killer audio. One of the things I like about D is that he comes across as a really nice guy. He comes across as a really decent, sometimes misguided, and when, especially when it came to that weird coupling thing with the kind of swinging, the swinging that he did with uh, his wife, Kelly's wife, and Kelly. But in general, he comes across as a decent, kind guy, a very likable, very different than the kind of satanic monster that men like him are often accused of. Remember, he was at a time when the average person was a, a demonic, you know, a demonic creature. They queued up to see Catholics or Protestants being born in a, an industrial level in the most horrific uh, witch hunts and witch trials. Remember, most of the so-called witches that were killed were actually Catholics or Protestants, and some Jews, very few of them, were actually witches. That's a, that's a, a Wiccan New Age invented thing. These people would have died, you know, reciting the Lord's Prayer or reciting, you know, Psalm 23. They wouldn't have died, you know, being Wiccans. Or, they would have been horrific. They would have been horrified to think that anyone thought that they were witches. They were not. They were called witches as a propaganda thing. D and a time when this all these mon monstrous things were going down here was D, who was basically a, a a normal guy with a brilliant mind. And Queen Elizabeth the First has to be given a lot of credit as well. She did, she was a remarkable woman who knew her stuff, and even the idea that she made herself a pro a Protestant Virgin Mary was a genius thing. I mean. You don't end a Catholic archetype overnight as the Virgin Mary so quickly. Her job as the Virgin Queen, which is the last thing she was, uh, was the Virgin Mary, the Fairy Queen, the Virgin Mary. She was a genius. She was a, she was a magician herself in her own way, although more of in a practical sense. She knew enough to employ the right kind of conjurers and mystics in order to deliver, shall we say, the... Real politic of the era. I know it's it's difficult for some people to listen to this kind of stuff, and for whatever reason, you know, I, can, I have no problem with the fact that they wouldn't take it seriously. I wouldn't have any problem with that. But the fact that they they would be you know, eternally negative towards it and not try to see any positives to it and then lock themselves into this state. You see that a lot of these, these truther types, they do this. They lock themselves into a kind of a dogmatic self imprisonment. You know what they remind me of? You know those all those hundreds of climbers who are still dead and still in the position they died in up on top of Mount Everest over the decades? They remind me of that, but they're that in terms of knowledge rather than in terms of mountaineering. Another synchronicity there. Crowley was a great mountaineer. Getting back to, away from the esoteric stuff about D, and getting back to what I told you about uh, the Pope's edict that he divided the Americas, the North America into Spain and Southern America into Portugal, it was D who went to Queen Elizabeth and told her that they should contest Pope Alexander's division of the globe. And he justified on the basis that several of the lands declared under the Treaty of Tortilidas to be the possession of the Iberian nations, such as free lands had already been, Frisia land had already been conquered by the British, the English. 
and this was the shall we say the legal justification for the creation of the British Empire. Much of the information for this again came from magic kind of ideas, including a letter from Mercator, who had written to him earlier in the year, in which the great cartographer, which is what Mercator was, had claimed that the story of King Arthur's incursion into the northern indrawing sea areas around the pole in 530. He cited sources showing that some of the 4,000 lost members of the exhibition had survived, and the proof being that eight of their descendants had appeared at the King of Norway's court in 1364. Therefore, that part of the world, northern Canada, was English. You know, D had been working on this idea of the of the creation of the British Empire or Imp I M P Empire. For he'd been working on it for ages, and uh, up to this point when he proposed it to Queen Elizabeth, and he su he suggested it in a whole series of books aimed at shifting or altering English foreign policy into a more adventurous adventurous and expansionist idea, so therefore a quest. Remember I was saying earlier on about the, the the soldiers capturing the mountain? There's a difference between it being a an assault and it being a magical quest. He created this magnum opus called the British Empire, B-R-Y-T-I-S-H-I-M-P-I-R-A, -I -I -E, entitled the general and rare memorials pertain to the perfect art of navigation. This, uh, this book was a sensation at the time, but it has been discounted by most Tudor historians for the unfortunate reason that because these magical ideas did not fit into, you know, enlightenments, post-enlightenment ideas of biographies and historical revisionism even though it was the, the magical ideas inside it that actually led to it. It's probably the earliest authoritative statement on the idea of a British empire was delivered to the Queen to make its, uh, to make its first political, and just as about as the empire was about to make its first appearance in the world. These memorials were a typical deproduction, practical, political, scholarly, but highly mystical. The title page contained all the elements in an elaborate allegory of what he called the British hieroglyphic, basically the sigil for the British. Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, she sits on the realm of a ship of imperial monarchy watched over by St. Michael and is drawn by the figure of the Lady Occasion or Lady Opportunity or Madame Fortune, as the French call her. To be in a fort to a fortified citadel overlooking conquered lands. Above Elizabeth in the graphic in the sigil is the sun, the moon, the stars, and a glowing sphere bearing the tetragrammaton, the potent Kabbalistic formula of which shines down on the blessings of the enterprise. So Queen Elizabeth was handed a capitalistic document which contained on the title page a sigil outlining the creation of the British Empire. And you guys out there have, I know you have a lot of, you do learn this stuff, and you do, you come aware that magic plays and occult plays an enormous part in the role of the creation of the elite worldview. And then you go out and you tell people in a very bad way, and that's why they laugh at you. If you have good documentation like this, and you can point this out, people will then pay attention. In the first volume of these memorials, uh, Dee had focused on building a, a substantial navy for Britain. He called this the master key. Again, this is a, a magical term, like the key of Solomon. Of the, you know, pertained to the whole scene and would provide the security England needed to get their imperial ambitions, imperial ambitions. Since the end of the reign of Henry VIII, England had almost no ships, no, almost no standing navy. And the fleet was tiny. I think it was like 30 or 40 ships. And when Elizabeth came to power, and most of them were in bits, as I said before, Spain had 
200 ships, massive, enormous armada ships. Now, how, how they paid for all this was, according to Dee, the money for would come from the Queen, not from the Queen's own coffers, but through a series of taxation on the grounds that it would ultimately be the nation's wealth and not just hers that would benefit from the investment. That, this is a monumental moment. This is a monumental moment in history. You're all, like, oh, no taxation, no taxation is kept and all this stuff. By telling, now the only one that would have paid taxes back then would have been the merchants and the aristocrats. But by paying these levies, they were financing a magical quest. You understand? They were not, and that would ultimately serve them because if the in, if the impish empire, the English empire, imperial objectives came to pass, they would reap the benefits and not just the queen. A brilliant piece of psychological statesmanship. In the second volume of these, there was loads of navigational tables of longitude and latitudes uh, pertaining to Dee's invention of his own. He had this thing called a paradoxical compass. I always thought the paradoxical compass would be a brilliant name for a band. The paradoxical compass for an album or something. But anyway, this was uh, bigger than, it was actually larger than the English Bible that had been translated around that time, well, earlier. And which was itself was almost a magical book at that point anyway, because so many people had been killed to defend the English the English Bible as it had been basically like the German Bible of the Lutherans. It was a, a kind of a, a, a spell casting thing towards the Vatican. It was printed on these things called choirs of paper. They were huge sheets and the manuscript and the draft is sadly lost and it was too big to publish at the time. We only have these own journals and what's in it to to know what it was about. The third volume was so secret that D pledged it should be utterly suppressed or delivered to Vulcan's custody. That means that the only one who could read it would be the Queen. Meaning that the Queen could read it once and then burn it. And like the second volume, it's lost. And the final volume that is that we, we, we still have is on famous and rich discoveries. And it was, funny enough, born itself accidentally. And that, that remain born part is, well, what's left of it, is in the uh, the British Library. And it, it lists uh, basically the contents of the missing part. So that's how we know what's in the two previous volumes, because it's the contents and kind of the, uh, the index towards them with further explanations. This is a great tragedy of the loss of those two books that went to Vulcan's fire. At the same time, Dee himself was also working on a manuscript that is exclusively for the Queen, almost like her own personal working document, framework document, of the, the leader of the British Empire. And it was, it was a small kind of like a Cliff Notes version of it. But in, it was actually more powerful. It was called the Britannici Imperium Limited, the limits of the British Empire, in which Dee claimed that the British Empire is not only Britain and Ireland, as well as the, the voyages of King Arthur, that would have been you know, the, the proposed ones, the, the, the trips to Canada. He cited other legendary miners, such as Madoc, the Welsh prince who set across Atlantic in 1170, which proved to be the great part of the sea coast of Atlantis, otherwise known as America, and also the isles around them, as down as far as Florida, and then all the islands of uh, in that area, and the Atlantic in between. And this was basically handed to the Queen as a grimoire. The Queen Elizabeth saying, this is the British Empire. And it came to pass. We all know that. We came to pass. Now, in the inside, there were several drafts of it. But the one that she received had a map, which now has been lost, which marked the extents of the domain. Remember the stories I, at the show I did a while back on that nation magic? The idea that an actual domain of a nation is essentially a magic circle. And this magic circle is really what determines the, the, the shall we say, the security inside the magic circle. Uh, 
compared to what's beyond in the frontiers. Well, it's the same idea with an empire. You can't just say we're going to conquer the whole world or you can't just say, well, let's see what happens. You have to basically allow someone else to conquer this territory and then you, which the Spanish did, and the Portuguese, and then you, as the British, draw, draw it into your own magic circle and own its power. So, along with his, along with his books on the occult at Mortlake, Dee also developed one of the greatest geographic and maritime libraries on the earth at the time, including vast amounts of maps that included over, not only sea voyages, but overland journeys to Asia and so on. And any news that came in of discoveries and navigation, remember he had very good connections to the docks in London through his father's. His father's work there was, their father was dead by then, but he, he had connections down there. He would find out there was business like, like Adrian Gilbert, who I mentioned earlier on, John Davis, and they were this odd couple who D found very argumentative and fellow both of them eventually made friends with them. And John Arbery, who called Gilbert the greatest buffoon in English history, and D had about the same opinion of him. But Davis wasn't, he wasn't really a buffoon. He was more of a, a eccentric opportunist. And eventually he was arrested by the English Privy Council for using a, message to, a mission to organise by the Earl of, Earl of Cumberland to launch an unprovoked attack on a friendly trading vessel owned by Venetian merchants. But again, this is the kind of classic thing that D had to tolerate these obnoxious figures. You know, I was always saying about, you know, truth and magic is kind of relative in a way that you take what's available at the point that can actually help you. And this is what D did with the likes of these characters, like both Kelly and Gilbert. The British or Britannic, Britannica Imperii Limitus it was a vision of a new world order. This is where this idea of the new order, the new world order came from. And it was to unite, ultimately bring Christianity back together as one force to end the sectarian wars in Europe, build a new Jerusalem, you know, in England. And at the moment, at the moment, Elizabeth loved the idea. And then her privy council came in and, you know, basically discarded it. But it, the, the spell had been cast. There was enough it, There was enough fruitiness in there, enough magical language in there to place the idea not into only into Elizabeth, but into the body politic of the English court, which was to basically bring this magical spell into fulfillment. You ever notice the way I always tell you about magic is often poetic? Say you... You create a magic spell or you create a sigil saying, I have a million, a million dollars. And the million dollars will not appear, but you might be involved in a horrific industrial accident or car crash. That's not your fault. And you get a million dollars in compensation or a million dollars in a lawsuit. But you got your million dollars. You may be, have to spend a lot of it on your care. But you get this way. Be very careful. With magic, magic is itself a kind of. A, you have to make sure all your dots and all your eyes. You've dotted all the eyes and crossed all the T's. But magic has a poetic unfoldment, and the creation of the British Empire by D was itself a magic unfoldment in the poetic sense. It all came to pass in the end for D. He his version of the world came real. It came to pass, and he achieved it. Didn't see it in his lifetime, like so many of the greats. Didn't financially gain from it in his lifetime, but he had a magical adventure, a magical quest, where he was seen at one time as the most, him and Kelly, the most two most powerful people in Europe. You had, when Ke you had at one point the, the Russian court, the French court, you name it, all of them, and the English court vying for them as if they were like two of the top superstars in the world because whoever could create gold from alchemy could create the world and he did create the gold in the end as we know from the great from the alchemists of the middle ages 
And this was specifically brought about by Jung's work. We know that in alchemy, it's the what's really doing is you're building an alchemical engagement with your own psyche. The gold is the unleashing of your own personal potential and decast that shadow across across the the face of history and it's living with us to this day. I know no matter who it's I am always, I talk about or what I'm talking about, it always comes back to Carl Jung with me. But that's because he he's almost like a form of out you know, a philosopher's stone of knowledge himself. And while these, the alchemists were experimenting, like the, the alchemists of the Middle Ages, before these time, they were experimenting in their laboratories. And they often reported confrontations with terrifying monsters. Jung was the one who saw these monsters as archetypal images, which he described the psychic and the psychological conditions of the alchemists' underground states of depression, despair, frustration, desire, and so on, that could be parallel to the stages of the individual process during analysis, in psychoanalysis. So basically, let's look at Kelly as being conjuring Medini in this state. This is the monster. They may well be real monsters. They may not be. And Medini and the other monsters, many of them terrifying, was a result of Kelly's deep-rooted, shall we say, sense of failure and disappointment. Now, Kelly absolutely was not a charlatan, not at all. He's been described as a charlatan by some people, and I can't believe it. I think, what, I can't remember, what was it Terence McKenna called him? A rat, a rat scallion or something? Or a kind of, a, you know, he, 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 he tried to make out he was some kind of swindler. Now, he wasn't. He was, he, Kelly was the real thing. He wasn't pulling the wool over John Dee's eyes. It's just that they ultimately their partnership failed. They 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 end they they had the classic issue that the alchemists of the Middle Ages had. Well, making the recipe for the stone, there was a constant theme. This is one of the things that Jung discovered was of a chemical marriage between a king and a queen, which is gold and silver. They unite. There they die. And they're reborn as a Siamese paired hermaphrodite. This is always comes up in the alchemy of the Middle Ages. And you this this idea was heavily meditated on upon on upon by Jung, that the idea of the marriage and the, the king and the queen, gold and silver, describes in in Jung's case, analysis itself, in Dee's case, himself and his relationship with the queen. And the transference of this relationship, you know, I spoke to you tonight about transference, the transference of this relationship between the analyst and the patients is the same thing as the transference of this relationship between Kelly and D or D and the Queen. This is why I like Kelly or so, D so much. D it comes across as a real man, as genius as he was, who was working from his heart. There was a 17th century, there's a very famous 17th century around the time, a bit later, actually, over 100 years later after D, called the Rosarium Philosophium. It's a woodcut and it shows, it beautifully shows the description of the, the alchemical process as a mercurial fountain. You have this vessel in which the work takes place and it contains the divine water. There's, there are, it's got stars at the four corners and there are four elements separate of the hostile states which needed to be united. Do you remember me? in the Druid Code how I wrote about the four functions of the psyche? The four, how the number four is so integral in magic, philosophy, alchemy. And then the fifth, I, sh I, said, I showed it in terms of the Celtic cross. The fifth function is the wholeness of the self. This is what, this is the, this, this, is, this is basically telling you that all these alchem alchemists, including Dee himself, was searching for the knowledge of his own existence. The stars on the Mercurial Fountain woodcut are made interesting too. There's the six planets that were visible at the time. Remember, D was heavily involved in astrology. And there's a triple fountain in the middle, which is full of Mercury. And this is the Mercurial Fountain. It is the catonic 
or underground counterpart of the Christian Trinity. Mercury is the water in the mercurial water. It causes great elation and depression. Just like any lifetime experience you or any kind of like breakthrough. It, we're going, I know we're going a bit away from D here, but like I'm always trying to throw things in here to make you think different. Right? At the end of the day, my ultimate point in this was showing D as a normal man, as a human being, full of all the attributes and failings the rest of us have. And the, the, the Mercurius is the water in the fountain, and it symbolizes the unconscious mind. The process begins with a disunion, a disintegrated and unredeemed state among the four elements or functions. You read the Druid Code. And redemption or wholeness in the fifth element, the unseen God in the middle. Joseph Camel spoke heavily about that. There is a process to this alchemical thing, and it describes perfectly. I don't know. I, I'm not aware of anything that D and Kelly were studied by Carl Jung, but just it, they were almost like a king and a queen in their relationship. And in the alchemical way, and, and very much so, Dee was the queen. Kelly was absolutely the instigator. Kelly was the king. Now, the king and the queen are the sun and the moon, the animus and the anima. The supporters, they are fully clothed and they're distinguished by their natural state they left they have a left handed sh- handshake so it's a a a sinister union right this is the so kelly and d they were brought together by a left handed handshake in they went into a sinister union within the cult the left side is the dark side of the unconscious and it suggests an incestuous marriage now this is going to get very powerful later when we find out that both Kelly and Dee, because of Medini's suggestion within the scrying mirror, they embark on a coupling in which Dee had sex with John with, with Kelly's wife and Kelly had sex with Dee's wife. This was part of the alchemy. The king and the queen, they hold out branches with four flowers and four elements. The dove or holy ghost descends and unites them in a union which is also spiritual. Incest, the union of like and like symbolizes marriage of one's being becoming the self according to Jung. This was this was this was D incorporating Kelly into fulfilling an aspect of his own psyche that wasn't present. And the king and queen are unconscious figures in always in the alchemist and the female anima assistance. This incestuous left handed handshake that unconscious is about infantile fantasies. Kelly had an attractive, now D had an attractive young wife. Kelly wanted to shag her. Kelly seems to have had, D seems to have had a, an infatuation with the sexy demon or angel Medini, who appeared in the scrying mirror, although he didn't actually see what she looked like. She was just described by, by Kelly. There's a point where the king and the queen confront each other, and this is in the alchemical wedding again. And they're both without conventional disguises. They've both stripped naked. So remember, Kelly and Dee had sex with each other's wives. And this nakedness, according to Jung and the other psycho- psychoanalysts, is that it, it represents the integration of the shadow part of the psyche. The shadow. You see, this is when it, this is the shadow part. And the, shat- the, the assimilation of the shadow brings the return to the body. It's the, the classic conjunction of opposites, the soaring eagle of the ego and the toad of the shadow. Now, at that point, the king and the queen, within the chemical wedding, they descend into the water. This is the unconscious. The immersion is a night sea journey or dissolution, which returns them to dark internal states. The well is the uterus in which they were born. This was the Kelly and Dee's journey, their quick escape from England, where they were being heavily watched as spies and also by the the you know England could have flipped back to Catholicism two of them could have borne this was Kelly and Dee's escape into Europe. The king and a queen are united above and below by the dove and also the water of Mercurius, the unconscious. The king and the queen, the body and spirit are unrelated without I'm reading from Jung's notes here, Carl Jung's notes, and just putting them 
I'm overlaying Kelly and Dee's relationship upon this to bring them, bind them together. The dove and the water symbolizes the bond of the soul. That's being the unrelated human being can achieve wholeness only through the soul. Then the sea now engulfs the king and queen. That's Kelly and Dee being engulfed by the holy sea of the Roman, the holy Roman Empire. The coitus occurs in the water. Remember, they have their sexual coupling in Europe, in the unconscious, and they have returned to the beginning, the only the unleashed chaos. This is like the chaos, and this is when the chaos the chaos happened. Then they both die and they putrefy. This is in the alchemical wedding. The king and the queen die and they're melted into a, one being with two heads. It's a hermaphrodite. This was the point at which D had everything he needed to know from Kelly. Remember, he kept his head, but not his body. And after intercourse, a state of purification sets in. This was the, the coupling. And the sin of incest and con- conception is known as the negred state of blackness, which requires the alchemist self-cleansing. This was him getting rid, getting rid of Kelly and returning back to England. Then the soul departs from the spirit and the body of the king and the queen in great distress. This was Kelly's doubts. It does not have to come from above to animate the body, but leaves the body to mount heavenwards. Later, it will descend as a healing force and a savior parallel to Christ's coming. That did not happen until Kelly was killed. Then this thing called the, the Aqua Sepatina, the water of wisdom, it's kind of a mist, depends, and then illumination washes away the darkness and sunrise again begins after the darkness. At this point, it's known that the, when this happened, that the alchemists used to burn up their books. They used to burn their books. This was the symbolic casting off of Kelly by D. Because he has the theoretical understanding. It didn't work for him. It worked for D. But remember, D, sorry, it worked for Kelly. It didn't work for D. Kelly, the union of opposites, is, it happened through these, these connections of Kelly and D through their work. Then the soul dives from heaven to breathe life into this hermaphroditic corpse. And two ravens at the bottom of the image of the, the mercurial fountain in the camp, alchemy indicates the pair of opposites still exists within spheres, spheres of the unconscious. And the winged and wingless birds symbolize the double nature of the Mercurius, the earthly underworld and the airy upper world. Then a new birth happens. They're reborn as the Rebus, in which the winged hermaphrodite standing on the moon with the snakes and a raven still present, creatures associated with the devil. The desired, the desired goal of alchemy is this form. Kelly and... D went their separate ways. Kelly became successful in the creation of the gold from alchemy. It was witnessed by courtiers and members and diplomats, a privy council of the Bohemian court. D escaped and his victory was his life. He lived to die of old age. Kelly lived like a, I think actually Rudolph gave him a, 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 a title. He actually made him aristocrat. Eventually he was arrested again. He tried to escape from prison. He jumped out the window of his tower. He died from the fall. And the last entry in the alchemical wedding between John Dee and Edward Kelly was in Dee's own diary. And he simply wrote, Kelly is slain. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. You learned a lot more than you knew about than the usual stereotypes. It's given you food for thought. And I'll be back again on Sunday. And until then, look after yourself. Be good to yourself. Remember, the journey always is within. And the salvation is never from without. And feck them if they can't take a joke. Good night.
o ai ai di o a so ma ma o t a n e d a a o v a o da co glo o a i a pil cas a mag a o zon gohon hox match o i a pil cas a mag Olen bial babel de sibsi enya de toglo gi at. <laughs>